Hey all, welcome to week 12, or week 12 lecture on drapery. Just wanted to make sure that we're still keeping on track. Just remind you of the syllabus. I um, know this is a pretty um, strange way to finish off the semester, but just only a few more to go. So three more lectures, um, and then three more assignments coming up. Um, and then in addition to the head drawing one that you're working on now, that that will be it. So that's the all the stuff that you're responsible for getting in. Um, so today, like I said, we'll go through drapery. I'm going to explain to you how um, to add drapery to the figures that we've been doing. And then the homework is um, 20 figures total, and you can lay them in however you choose. You can do the alternative method that we've been spending time learning, or you can start with that original method. At this point, you can choose however you want to work. But each group of five, you should pick a different time period so that the type of dress or the type of costume you've chosen won't be the same. You'll be doing 20 drawings of the same. So like maybe five from like the Victorian era, five from um, you know the medieval time, not the restaurant. Five from maybe a, a movie you really like the costume design from, like Star Wars or something. Um, so you can mix it up, but as long as each set of five is a different reference, then it's fine. Um, it's just so that you get a little bit more of a perspective on you know, what, what is done with clothing and how it adds to the figure. Next week we'll talk about hands and then feet, and that's it. So again, if you have any questions, um, you want feedback, it's hard to give feedback, but I um, have been doing the Zoom meetings. If you'd like to have your work reviewed, um, we I have plenty of time. I'm happy to do that if you want to set up a meeting, or we can also uh, I can record something for you. If you want your homework reviewed and kind of a, in a recording, I can send you feedback in that way too. So um, just making the best of this kind of strange turn of events, uh, but just reminding you here of what what is to come. Okay. So we're going to start here, and you can see I've chosen two different references. Um, I tried to pick things that are really different. So here we have, um, this is early American illustration. This is a, a wartime illustration by Charles Dana Gibson. So it's uh, World War I. And so we're going to look at this one. Like the, There's obviously a lot of things going on there with the drapery. And then I chose um, it, the monster. And it's just because you know, they're pretty dramatic in terms of the characters they represent. Um, so that's what I'll be breaking down. I've already laid them in just to save us time. This is something now that we actually worked on this a lot, um, it, you know, probably a, a week too long. Uh, but we had that odd transition with this new format after spring break. So these are all laid in. This is how I would approach these drawings. Um, and now in terms of drapery, just as a, a way to get us started, there's a few things that we should keep in mind. So the good news is that when we draw, or when I think of drapery, I'm only ever thinking of seven folds. That's all there is. So if you're, if you're copying every single wrinkle and line, it's a total waste of time. You can get away with seven uh, as long as you design them well, like in response to what's underneath. And even more than, or even better, is that there's really only six active folds. So six active folds, meaning um, the six that are active show the movement of the figure or are responsive to the way that the figure uh, sits. Right? It's, you want to make the, the drapery always feel like it has the presence of the figure under. The one that isn't uh, included is called an inert fold, so I-N-E-R-T, and an inert fold is just nothing. It's like if you take your shirt off at the end of the day and throw it on your bed, like whatever that shape is, is inert. It's not showing anything except maybe like the structure of the bed, but it's like a pile of wrinkles. And that's what I see a lot of students focus on or fixate on, is like all the wrinkles or the you know, the imperfections and drapery, and it just doesn't do much. Like there's not a lot of story there. So you can focus on six. That's all I'm going to do um, when I look at these two. 
So what do we have in addition to drapery? Well, drapery gives us some really important things. I mean, first of all, we can finally not be drawing naked people all the time, so that's a plus. But in the addition of clothing to the body, you get shapes and silhouettes. You get so these two things, a, a shape or a silhouette, is really crucial for storytelling. So uh, we can go back to that lecture on the first week when I broke down the character archetypes and how there was the hero and the heroine and the brute and all of these different types and the way that we get those looks or those silhouettes is primarily through clothing because you know people's bodies change but not that radically um, so we get shapes now what do we want to focus on in terms of shapes if you have an interest in design or character the main shapes you're using are these three and each one has a specific story value to it. So, you know, a lot of the times triangles can be either stable if they look like this, if they're turned upside down or they get a little bit more pointed, then it's a, a violent or aggressive quality. Spheres or curves are usually passive. Um, boxes are usually stable. And so fashion designers or costume designers might use these in combinations to create effects as blends between those qualities. So um, more than that, or, or I guess m more simply, think of like a time period, you know, and, and you could usually generalize a, a silhouette that's representative of that decade. Like uh, an example would be like, uh, I think it's like 60s or 70s, everybody had bell bottoms. And that's like a really specific silhouette to the bottom of the leg. Right. So that silhouette or shape is now like representative of a decade in time. And so that's a really important quality or tool for giving your characters context. And most of us know that. We're going to pick up on that immediately, right? If there's a and that's the value of studying a little bit of, you know, clothing and its history. Okay, so there's that layer. Uh, there's the layer of like storytelling and and playing with shape, which is really fun. And then in addition to that, drapery brings along with it the issues of like texture. In the body, we had some textures, but they were limited, hair, skin, you know, those types of things. But that's really expanded with clothing because you could have silk or satin or burlap or denim or whatever it is, and there's a massive range. Uh, so that's one thing. You also get a clearer idea in most cases of the environment. And this is something that could relate. I mean, both of these could relate to story. Right, because a character that is, you know, heavily clothed, is going to live in a cool climate. Someone that is kind of like barely dressed or has like a great economy of clothing probably lives in a desert environment. So all of these things aren't really something that will hold bearing on your homework assignment. Uh, but if you have an interest in kind of pushing this further or playing with it, then these things will become much more important. So that's the kind of the value of them. This is more the, the practical consideration for what is we want to do with them. To now digest that into how we would draw. So this is our basic lay-in. And one step that might be helpful to add on top is to um, very lightly include your landmarks. So when we did these, and that's what your quiz was on, we talked about how you know it's important to know these names and that the the value of doing their, uh, the finding these areas, bony areas of the bone or of the body and the skeleton give you a, a solid structure, a feeling of perspective. Uh, so these are also really important areas for drapery. So if we give them a, a renaming, I would refer to them in the context of drapery as tension points. Because every time you have one of these, um, bony eminences or areas that push on the body this is a really clear and direct area that drapery grabs onto or is able to um, or will be pushed by so like sternum rib cage the the pelvis if you can just come in quickly over your lay-in and jot these in it doesn't have to be by any means like elaborate. I'm just kind of putting in dots that I know 
uh, from the landmark study that I think are likely going to be influencing the, the fabric. And the, the goal in doing the fabric is not to draw it like uh, the fabric has suffocated the figure. The goal is to make the fabric feel like it's an addition. It's in a response to the body underneath. So I'm just putting in like my straights for the legs and then the elbow. So, you know, think of these, you don't have to think of them exactly like how we used them before. Try to remember again that they're landmarks renamed as tension points. So that's the, the renaming. And then the way you should think of them is that your landmarks in the con or the tension points in the context of drapery are really just this. Like you all have closets with you know, clothing hanging from the wire hanger. That's what your skeleton is for drapery. So to understand the tension points is to know that drapery is always going to be tight or kind of fitting at the tops and then because of gravity will always hang from there and respond to that shift in um, surface caused by the bone or in this case the hanger, right? So just think of your skeleton now as a really flexible or animated um, wire hanger. Okay, so the goal is going to be to go through six, you know, draw them here kind of off to the side. You put some additional examples down in case um, anybody wants to see more. And then so we have six, I'm just going to draw them as little diagrams over here. And then each time we finish one, I'll come in on top of one of these or both and just show you where it exists. So these two, use these as examples for how you would do homework. All right, so your homework would start with everything that I've just done here on both. That's step one. Uh, and I'll, I'll put these on different layers too, in case you want to see them as uh, JPEG. So step one is just to um, lay in the figures like you have in terms of shapes, making sure your proportion is correct, and getting the landmarks to sit on top. Past this, you're going to be thinking about the actual kind of designs of the drapery. Okay, so first fold is called a pipe fold. And so like everything that we've done, this first one will spend a little bit more time explaining it. And then after this one, it'll go much faster. So pipe folds have um, some really crucial qualities to them that will always appear in the same way or in a very consistent way. And so when I define these, I'm always going to have recourse or describe them by way of what tension points or what configuration of tension points creates that. Because then when you go back to do your drawings and you see your skeleton, you'll know where these are likely to take place. So let's... Okay, so what can we do with these tension points? Well, everything that we discussed is going to have a uh, some representation here. So the collection of tension points is going to give you the fold, but inherent in the fold there's also going to be a shape. And part of how you're going to get this to sit over your drawing is that you're going to have to wrap that shape with your T overlaps. So T and then your wrapping lines. So basically you have to kind of fit it around everything you've done prior. But because the body can move, this shape will also have a gesture. So you'll define that by way of C and S curves. So C or a squash and stretch. Okay, so what does that look like? What does a pipe fold look like? So this is one, two, three. Pipe folds are always made from tension points that are super consistent. So kind of like that. Um, their characteristic is that they always respond to gravity. Right? So gravity is a big player in drapery, even more so than we, you know, way more than we would see in the figure. So we have this as like almost a permanent gesture with drapery, as it's always following gravity. It's always dropping down. So pipe folds look like this, except the way they get their name is it looks like a row of pipes lined up one next to the other. So this is like a cylinder, 
but then pipe folds always have a asymmetry and that one comes forward and then one goes back or the next goes back like this so there's always like out in um, so the bottom will create this type like wave pattern like back and forth at the very top you would have a, um, a squash like or a C curve you'd have the drapery hanging or suspended between those points so like the easiest example to to give for this would be maybe your shower curtain or window coverings um, these always have like a really clear quality of tension points more specific to the figure would be like a, a dress or a skirt right so a skirt would have you know the let's say this is the waist in 3d and you would have like these tension points that go all the way around and it kind of creates that pleat um, so you'd have like a dress or a skirt that has this type of quality so in out. Uh, but it can really happen anywhere right? in any degree it's just a matter of identifying how those tension points are working okay so that's tension points this is the type of shape you get but we have to deal with gesture and so think of this with that analogy to like your window covering or shower curtain if you push on the tension points or close the the curtain then that distance is going to get nearer and that will affect the shape this might be more of a stretch shape right because the the shape is longer maybe there's more of an s curve down there but if i do the same right, six tension points but bring them really close together then maybe these get bigger like the c curves become more dramatic at the top because now there's more excess fabric here and then these get a little longer because they're no longer stretched out so it could look like this and that's the basic challenge of drapery minus one thing which is just now putting it over the figure here it's shown as something that's flat right without any influence except the tension points what you would have to make sure that you do when you start a drapery or start a fold is always begin it and end it on some kind of wrapping line or perspective indication so like here it begins and ends as an ellipse you just don't want to begin it and end it like this because then it's going to flatten out everything that you've worked hard to develop because right? this just means that it's you know like a 2d representation of the same thing so that's it now let's take and see if we can find um, pipe folds on any of the two examples so first um, let's look at this one and it's kind of like a very classic get a darker color so pipe folds here would be most of what she has like she's basically a giant pipe fold and so when I'm doing my studies what you definitely do not have to do is go through and copy every single bump and every single wrinkle and every single perfectly kind of detailed line you're just trying to get the basic idea so like uh, I see that there's one two three four five tension points and so every time I draw one I'll first start by identifying it and then I'm gonna wrap it over the arm so that's a wrapping line as soon as I start to describe it I create a wrapping line and then here it's just kind of dropping down and so it's just look like this so that's kind of the shape I'm getting and it curves back in and hits near the knee this is uh, a good rule when we look at the end of the arm so the rule for drapery is anytime fabric ends so here's your rule whenever you see something end like the end of a sleeve or the end of the shirt or the neck it always ends in the perspective of what it's under or I'm sorry over in the perspective of what it's over so this is just going over the perspective of that form so this part comes down too and I'm not uh, copying I'm just getting the basic idea and then as it goes up I see it it's doing the same thing again kind of comes up a little bit and then it grabs over the arm and then has a pull down just like we were talking about with gravity here I always even though it's small like that little bump I bring up above the the cylinder 
just so it feels like it's not perfectly uh, tangent to the arm. Like this is showing that there is some structure to the fabric. Maybe it wouldn't have that if it were like, um, you know, silk. It would be much more form fitting. Here's another one. And then that drops, kind of hits near the hip. Then we have the shoulder, this one, so all these. And so each time I'm bringing it down, I'm trying to reference whatever the body part is. Like this goes across the chest and swings back down and kind of hits the hip. And that would actually be a tension point because now the fabric is getting caught there. And now it's changing direction to kind of roll with the structure of the leg and hip. So that's all a wrapping line. And then that shape ends here. This we see a lot in, you know, like this elegant look for antiquity or like, you know, look at the princess designs from Star Wars. Um, you always see this kind of elegant look for like the, the arms and uh, beautiful looking kind of graceful women or characters like that. And that, that's it, right? Like what I'm not going to do is come in and, and try to hatch everything out or render everything. I'm going to try to keep this as much as a linear exercise as possible just so I learn what I'm seeing. I don't want you to render anything. I don't care that you, you know, put in 400 hours. Not that any of you would, but like this is it. That's all you should be worried about. This side, same thing. Here's the tension points. I'm just kind of giving myself a reference. Let's just do these first few. I'm going to leave the elbow for later. And then this comes out across the chest, drops down. Then this comes over the arm. And this one's more pinched. So where this one's like kind of more of the, the first example where the shower curtain was open, because the arm's moving in, it's pushing the fabric against the chest. So that's creating a pinch. So that's all maybe more of a C curve. So that looks like this. And then maybe just two. Normally my design or what I focus on is I never use more than three or I try to describe something in three lines at the most. Because otherwise if you don't you you'll start to get um, you'll lose yourself in like detail and over description. And then if I look at her waistband that's a good wrapping line. That's something that I could definitely use. This waistband creates tension points because it's tight to the fabric underneath it. And the effect of that is that it cinches it. Right? So even if this is one long garment, right, that is affecting the tension point. Even if you just grab your shirt and pull it like that, you've just made a tension point. So tension points don't have to be from the skeleton. They're just uh, usually from the skeleton. And then same, same approach. Once I find these, if it's not affecting the body, I'll just bring it straight down. And then here it starts to push against the ground. So I'm gonna turn the curve and then it kind of goes over the foot a little bit. So I'm just following the wrapping line and then back up just to give the whole shape. And so this is like a really feminine um, shape. It's like that elegant kind of triangle shape. So we have that one done. Most of the tension points are kind of in the middle of the waist, getting pinched by the, the thigh pushing against the other leg. So I might add more lines closer together there. And then on this side less so. Now look how the drapery is pushing against the knee here. So that creates a little bump or that creates a tension point. And then from that, the, the fabric responds differently. So it's grabbing here. And then because of that, it more tightly follows the tibia as it pulls back and then kind of goes over and then joins up with the rest. So here I use the pipe folds to kind of broaden out and get the larger shape of the figure. And I did a lot with this one because there's that's mostly what's there. It's mostly what we're seeing. Okay, so that is pipe folds. We can take a look at the um, the other image as well, just to give a a basic idea. But I want to keep these all in layers so that you'll see the difference between them. 
All right, I want you to remember that when you're doing these, what's important is that you're putting the the whole idea of the oops, fabric over something, right? It can't just be that it's um, drapery drawn without some kind of structure underneath it. It's going to start to look really bizarre or at the worst flattened and kind of um, nonsensical. So I'm going to turn all this down. You understand now that it's there, but I want the fabric to be able to kind of stand out. Okay, um, now let's do the same one for Pennywise, who you should be able to see has a different shape design. Like this figure is all curves and uh, kind of beautiful flowing lines. And this character is really not. So if we look at the, um, you know, just as a way to play with pushing this idea, if I look at just these for how his structure is created, or how his silhouette is created. He's a lot of like spheres and triangles, but all of the triangles are really aggressive. So like his face is really just this shape. Um, the the use of the spheres is it looks as more like a way to well, it's like the the clown idea, right? That sharp is something that's aggressive. Spheres are always something that's passive or kind of welcoming, something that we like, like think of what's around, you know, babies, cute things, things that we usually uh, find attraction to. And so it's a kind of interesting design for um, building a tension between those, right? The, the triangle, which is predatory and threatening, and then the sphere. And that's really the idea of the clown, isn't it? That it's this, you know, uh, it's supposed to be at least this kind of friendly, kind of child-oriented uh, figure that, in this movie at least, eats eats them. So we have the, the one thing playing against the other. There's a few squares, like I guess his torso is pretty square, but look at some of the other shapes, like, you know, this structure that it kind of looks like his dress. That's a triangle combined with a sphere. So where it's like more explicit in the face, which is also the focal point because it's the lightest. The the rest of his body is really a combination of triangle and sphere. Here's the, like look at, this is the same shape as the dress or his waist. Then his arms, then we get down to the arms and then that same shape repeats at, at his cuff. And then his fingers are kind of like pointed so a little bit sharper, but that's repeated and it's in his, his pant again. So that's a way that drapery can really communicate way more interesting or kind of dynamic ideas than we would ever run across in just a description of anatomy and form. So let's check him out for pipe folds. Same thing, I'm not going to copy every single one. And if we just look at his collar, like this thing that kind of looks like a big Renaissance collar, there is hundreds of pipe folds in this, right? And they're all overlaid on top of each other. So I would not ever want to be in a position where I had to draw all of these. So I'm just going to like, sometimes I'll just fake it. Like I'll just kind of go around. I know the basic idea because I can see it, but I'm not going to copy every single one of those. But if you look closely, then they just kind of create this wave pattern, like what we just discussed. It's just on a much smaller scale. But the fabric responds in the same way because the tension point is creating the same pull on the fabric around the neck. And then the hair is back here. And then it happens like three times. Usually you see even in character design, no more than three textures in a figure or three layers. And that's what we have here. And one last one. You can see my lines are just kind of curving to suggest the structure of the body underneath. Here's my waves and then the little points. And I get um, the perspective here by overlapping one thing behind. So that's the T idea. 
we also have a lot of tension points in his poofy shoulders, or I'm sorry, pipe folds. These are just more descriptive of like the round kind of billowing shape. But if you look at the way that fabric runs through them, you can find tension points and they basically just kind of go like this. And then between them, you can see that there's a slight asymmetry and curvature. That's also happening here. So I won't go through all of these and do them, but I wanted to point out at least in some areas, these two examples where there's tension points. And I moved this over because my arm looked like it was too close in. So maybe on this one, I could just do one side. Here's his clown design, are those? And waistband. And then I think hopefully you can start to get a little bit more familiar with the idea of these all being tension points. Right? And how that creates a larger silhouette goes over the leg. So as soon as that line hits that area of the thigh, I want to take the shape and start to bend it up and over. If we don't, it's going to, or if I were to just draw it like I graphically drew the form breakdown over here, it's going to immediately look like it's flat. So it goes up and over, back down, kind of goes this way on this side, out, and then back up. And then plot your tension points, and then they don't have to right go straight down. Here they have a curvature. So here you kind of get an exception. And then I'm just giving the basic idea, which is what I expect from you at homework. But you don't need to make it look exactly like it to get the idea. So that's it on that one. That would be one fold, and you can see how how much you can do with just one. Okay, so both figures for a pipe fold. So that's done. I guess, you know, the difficulty that you're going to have to remain vigilant and kind of look for is that all of your folds do have the capacity to kind of combine together. So I can have a pipe fold combine with another one. Okay, so let's now move on to fold two. Fold two is a diaper fold, or I call it a diaper fold. Kind of looks like, like an old diaper. Not like an old diaper, but an old school diaper, like something they would use a long time ago. Diaper folds have two tension points. So it looks like that. So again, this is the process, so these are the steps that I'm going in. The tension points, um, so think of two tension points where they could occur on the body that kind of move closer or further. Those are areas that you're always likely to see these. And let's see. Okay, and so with the two diaper tension points, what we're going to see between them is a C curve to begin. So between these, I'm going to put this and then one beneath it to show the drapery as it's related to those two points kind of dropping and being pushed down by gravity. So another thing you'll get with a diaper fold is a little tiny singular pipe fold at the end. And so to make these look kind of irregular, I always do like a squiggle or an S curve and then bring the line uh, from that tension point down to the outside and then kind of overlap it here so it looks like there's maybe a little bit of excess fabric that's unfurling there. You get a couple um, lines in the center just to show that and then do the same thing over here. So that's diaper fold. Now what we have is a shape. We have the tension points. So the gesture would be moving these points closer or further. So again, further would be, that. so now we're not going to have quite as much of a dip. It's going to be more of like a, you know, a stretched S curve between, and then I won't maybe have as much excess on the sides. And so that might look like this. And then we could have the reverse, which would be 
that you have tension points very close together and now I have a much larger kind of sag or c-curve in the middle and then a thinner shape so you just want to get used to the idea of being able to manipulate these just so you have a, a familiarity or understanding of when they might come up um, in, in the body. So in terms of diaper folds on her, uh, the neck. So like we have tension point, clavicle, tension point, clavicle, diaper fold. Right. So if I'm drawing that for homework, I can plot my points. Here's a diaper fold. And then you could see how here it kind of pushes out with the with the chest. So if we have, remember I'm not going to go past three. So one, two, three. And then I always try to add irregularity. So like the spacing between these is all a little different. Uh, I just want it to feel like there's some difference between you know, all the because in the fabric itself you're never going to see like a, a perfect symmetry or placement. We could also think of like maybe this whole shape of the pipe folds is is really a diaper fold and then the pipe folds are just inside of that. All right so that could be the case like because this could be a diaper fold you know on this arm because there's a tension point here and then there's a tension point at the shoulder so maybe that could be a diaper fold too. Um, if we look down around the knee, tension point, and the tension point where the knee is pushed back. Right, so we have the bone of the knee where I drew the patella pushing forward, and then we have the pinch of the leg grabbing the fabric back there. And we could see how there's a diaper fold that kind of goes or relates the two, front of the knee, back of the calf. So this would be a an example of a combination, right? Because I have this big shape with pipe folds inside, but then inside I'm able to see, like even above that, there's a push of the thigh against the fabric, and then we get another little diaper fold above. So this is where drapery can get a little bit harder, is when you like see all of these folds starting to relate. From here down to here, that's a diaper fold. It's a big, right, like that, two points. So this is a way again that I would just break up the larger shapes, comes up, goes over and so it adds some visual interest to that shape. It also helps me build out some form right, to show like some of these curves and how they go around the different parts. Right, but that's probably enough or good enough for that side. So let's see if the character from it has diaper folds. Um, doesn't look like it quite as much to me. So I'm going to say probably not. He's like very structured. Like, I mean, these maybe, maybe there's some in here, but for the most part, he's really, like all of his fabric is pretty stiff. There doesn't seem to be like a, a this is maybe a description for a looser quality of, of drapery and how it hangs. So again, the progression of the homework. And I'm going to try to do each fold in a different color. That way um, you'll be able to see how they're all used differently and where. Uh, and really there's only a few more that are practical or like really uh, common. This is one of them, right? So this is a pinch fold. So think of any place on the body where you can pinch. Um, so like the easiest one is the arm to think of. So imagine, you know, you're bending your arm or you're bending your leg or your neck can bend against the shoulder or your knees can bend. So it's really common because we have so many parts you know that can articulate or kind of bend so let's imagine we have two cylinders this is the upper and lower arm here's the elbow and this is called a pinch fold so imagine again the lower arm is getting closer to the upper arm in that pinch so those are your tension points so that's where the fabric's gonna start to show and then on the elbow this is gonna get really pointed and sharp. So that elbow pushing out or ulna pushing out is going to be another tension point for your fabric. Now if we draw over this we would have in a pinch fold um, I always start from one and I make a wrapping line right, so that it feels like that pinch is related to the first area of 
uh, the form that's pinching. Then when it gets to the intersection between the two, I make a loop. So it feels like the fabric from the top and the bottom, or the two forms, is kind of pushing against. Right? So it's kind of these, this is like the compromise of them. And that usually gets shadow because it'll be a recess. And then I'll do the same thing on the upper arm. So you have really three lines, a curve, a curve, and, a, and like a teardrop or a loop shape. And then this one has to go back to the, the form. Okay, and then in any type of pinch fold, you always see like the top of the form or the area that's being pinched much more curved. And then because this is pinching, the bottom part of the, the form, in this case, the, the, the lower arm is really sharp. And that's because like the elbow is making this really taut. So you'd see something like that. So just remember two curves and a teardrop or a loop. And then again, if we're using the analogy of the arm, remember any time that fabric ends, it ends around the perspective. So let's do like a unbuttoned cuff. So, so it's kind of loose. So maybe you'd have something like this. It's like a formal shirt that would have like a cuff there. And that's even though it's irregular and doesn't match this perfectly because it's bigger, right, it still goes with that perspective and that's how we'll keep it related. So pinch fold, then just do the same thing. You can start by asking the question, you know, is that even taking place? Where on the body would I see that? And in this one, the easiest to see is probably the elbow there. So you can see the really dark shape. That's the loop. It's difficult to make it out because it's it's a little bit tinier. But you'd have the first, which is the forearm pushing down, the creation of the loop, and then you have the curve that's more directly related to the, the upper arm. So if we're going to draw that, it's a little harder because it's a smaller area. But we could do, so here's the upper arm coming up, just to give it a solidity. Okay, so one this is coming from here and then we have the loop which is kind of smaller and higher here because it's on top and then we have this one so three three lines right that's all you need I thought that was going to be more blue so there's your pinch and now we get a feeling for that area of fabric compressing uh, let's do the other side. So let's put this side. That's the part that's kind of coming down. And then coming back here. And then if we look at the way that the fabric ends, it does also describe the perspective of the, the arm coming forward. So it's like all of this. So there's your pinch. Um, any other pinches? I don't really see any on her. Uh, but that makes sense because I guess it's really the only area that's bent or that's pinched. Um, and then I don't imagine we'd have anything here, right? Because nothing is, is pinched on him. Yeah, I was just looking to be sure. Um, so again, that's the importance of the gesture or the figure underneath, the structure of the figure being laid in. Because depending on the pose, you can probably figure out what it is you're going to see early on. Like if you're seeing a lot of movement in the limbs and turning and twisting, um, then you're likely to see a lot more pinches and, and different type of active folds than, than I have here. Okay, so that is done. Pinch fold. Another one that's even um, probably a little bit more uncommon than that is a spiral fold. So this would be a fold that you would use to explain areas that can twist. So the easiest one would be the forearm, right? That's a easy example to think of because of how the upper arm can twist against the, the lower arm. Um, maybe your rib cage and pelvis could also be an example where you would have the rib cage able to twist against the pelvis. So because I don't think we have spiral folds on these two characters, we'll, um, we'll just do the diagram up here. So let's have our Here's our hand. Palm is up in this one. So thumb is over, or I'm sorry, palm is down in this one. Thumb's over here. And so these are the fingers. It's middle finger. 
and then small and pinky finger. Okay, so let's say this is the same type of um, clothing. Like we have a long sleeve shirt and the tension point for this might be a seam, right? Because that can also be a, a tension point is the natural construction of the fabric where it's held together. So maybe we have the seam, the, the fabric fitting over the shoulder, and then on this side, the forearm has turned and moved the thumb towards the inside of the body like that. And so that's caused for the fabric that would normally be straight to flip over. So here would be again the cuff. That's the end of the form. So in showing a spiral fold, I look for the tension points. Again, it would be here. And then because this is turned over, it's going to be here. In a spiral fold, you get three S's. You get one really long one, which is just connecting the dots. But when you connect the dots in a spiral fold, you you have to always make sure your lines go around the forms. So spiral fold can be tricky because it gives you, you know, this winding S that goes from top to bottom. You just have to make sure wherever that S goes, it wraps around a given form. And then you're going to have an S specific to each part. So let's say here we have, um, you know, like the elbow pushing down. Well, if this grabs the fabric as well, and then it pulls this way, we're going to have another smaller S or slightly smaller S pulling this way and then around. So that gives you like this form. And then if all the, the fabric is kind of pulling this way and then we might get like a little bit tighter fabric here. And then same thing up here, maybe we'd have um, another S curve from this point a little bit higher and then pulling around down here as well. So I always try to give an S curve for the center, right? The center, which was the whole of the arm and then a curvature or S curve to each specific form. So in, in terms of your S's, one, two, three, right? So I'm still keeping my rule or at least trying to. And then here, maybe because this is turning, the like fabric is really tight against the bicep because it's looser down here. Tie it against the forearm because it's looser up here. Maybe you could see this, um, so let's say arms, torso, and just so you have a, you know, you're ready for it, or maybe legs, depending. So spiral, done. Fortunately, I picked bad examples that don't really show it. Uh, and really now just two more. So fifth is what I call a Z fold, a Z fold, or some books call it a compression fold. And so this one I think we'll see a little bit more in our examples. So let's pick a new color to use so that you can see this one done. And so the uh, compression or the Z fold is kind of unique because it doesn't have um, as much of a clear use as of tension points as some of the others. Uh, and this one is you know, more specifically about the effects of, of gravity on the excess amount of, of fabric. So let's do like, let's just do a real simple foot here. I think this is probably the best way to try to show this one. So here's a toe, a big toe, and then smaller toes here. And so I think the easiest or one of the easiest areas to see this is um, with like pants as they hit against the top of the foot because it's so common I guess to have like baggy pants or excess fabric in the in the pants so like if I have that where there's a lot of um, you know excess or baggy uh, fabric and pants you'd have the basic shape of the pants right, coming down like this but by the time you have this excess and then something exerting um, like a, a tension point against it then gravity starts to kind of take over. And so what you get in here is a Z. Right? So if you can find where you think that begins and then where it's ending, you can take and put in a Z here that's slowly getting kind of collapsed. So there's like more distance, less, less, less. Um, and you can keep it going, right? At, at that point, it wouldn't be a Z, but it'd be like more of an accordion, as long as you always show that it's being compressed. 
So that is a characteristic that you'll always see in fabric when it comes up against uh, an ending. And what we'll see with the, the more form-based description is that you have the fabric kind of pushing out, but it's much like our gesture, where it's never, you can never have fabric just go straight across. It always kind of falls straight down, and then again, then again, and then here you would wrap whatever is left over the foot. So it feels like that's the that idea of the form or the foot, um, well, the fabric ending across the, the form as it ends. So in here, you know, with the Z-fold, sometimes it'll look like you have cylinders. So sometimes I'll draw cylinders on top of it to kind of give it this dimensional description. Um, but the reason that I would do that is because it helps with um, light and shadow to see what's going on. Because if we have something that's top lit, you would see maybe like this starting to get a form shadow, which now all of you hopefully have a pretty good understanding of. And then a little cast shadow in that pocket. Then you have the same thing here, like a form shadow, little cast shadow in this pocket. right? And so that would be the basic idea of the Z fold. Here, just taken a little bit further so that you can use value to understand it. Uh, so let's see if we have any. So this, this one, there's maybe some, but they're very small. So like if you look at the elbow, there's not a ton of fabric in here, but where there is excess around the joint, we could see like a tiny Z fold. So maybe you'd see something like this. Let me grab my purple. But that's kind of where I would start to zero in is any area that would have excess. And that area would because there's there has to be extra fabric for him to move. Unless I guess he had like some kind of spandex on. So you'd have it there. Um, usually you would see it against like one fabric tucking into another, so maybe there, like, but it's still really pretty weak. Um, you could see it, I think, on this elbow a lot better, where there's this line, this, this, and so you get that little curve. Uh, and it's a good design or fold for transitions, like to, to show how the upper and lower arms sit together, or the waist integrated into the pelvis harder to see again because of value but I think you like these lines those are Z folds so where is the like that cuff that's exerting a force there's a little bit of excess fabric in the pants and then because of gravity that gets uh, pinched or compressed and so now I'm going to design my curves keeping it asymmetrical and then kind of tucking it back in and then up here, you know, most of this we could see as having pipe folds or a pinch fold. And then, yeah, then all of this is the pipe folds. So that's Z on Pennywise. Let's see if we have Z folds here. I think we have a number of them. So where the diaper fold ended on her chest it becomes a z-fold like this this area so that is the fabric now compressing so I want to look for where the the points of it are and then as it gets nearer to the waistband it kind of starts to become more pinched so that explains the light and shadow patterns that I'm starting to see in here and that's kind of a, another diaper fold coming out from under the her shawl, I guess, or whatever the covering is called. Um, where else? Definitely at the bottom, like near her feet. So this is a Z fold. That's the fabric compressing against the top of the foot, kind of exactly like our example so here. So I'm just going to draw my Z, and I'm not, again, copying her. I'm just trying to draw the idea of it, and then making the curve from one one area to the next and then maybe like in this area too on the other side like where the uh, we made that a diaper fold on the back it starts to push against the foot as it's being raised I think that kind of looks to me like there could be a Z in there as well 
And you can see how by the time you start to work through these that I don't have much else. Like you don't need to like, have a whole mess of folds to try to understand what you're seeing. And it'll make it easier than if you just kill yourself trying to go through and copy them all by having five or six that you use as you know, a filter to understand what's there. So here's my last little one. And I, this would be done for homework. Like if you did something that looked exi you know, more or less like this, no rendering, no, you, we've, we've worked on that now, you're just trying to understand something else, um, I think this would be fine. It would be really good, actually. It explains just about everything that's there. You know, same thing with this one, should you uh, just develop the other side. Right, so you'd put the shape. And if you want to, um, you know, it's, it could be fun to pick movies and then try to see if you like character design and see how all the characters represent different shapes. Do try not to pick cartoons though, because we're less likely to see some of these natural effects of the fabric that we're trying to study. So if you are going to pick movies, just make sure they're live action. So that really leaves us one more. And the last one is kind of one that I add in because it's necessary, but not shown in our examples. And that's a flag fold. So something's called flag or cape. And the basic idea of this one is that it, it accounts for our idea that fabric or drapery is subject to environmental effects. So like, let's take the basic idea of a diaper fold. So that's a fold that we've had. Right? But the the thing that really defines the first five is gravity. Right? So gravity is pushing all of them down and all of their gestures are kind of moving with that. And if, like, So think here of a flag or a cape like Superman flying. I can draw a diaper fold, but if I give it a direction, now it's in response to character running like Batman or Superman. Or if it's a flag, it's wind because it's on a flagpole or a breeze. Uh, so it starts to tell us more about the environment that a character exists in or that story or the character's movement. So it's like really common in animation to this as a as a marker or description of that uh, drag, that sense of movement. So the only difference for this is that it has a different gesture It no longer is directly obeying gravity and it will always work at some kind of angle. And that's a great way of just trying to build out the idea of movement for a character. Um, so yeah, just think of Superman, you know, the flying, the, you wouldn't understand Superman to be flying quite as well if he, he didn't have a cape that expressed that directional shift or movement. But it's not really anything other than, at least in this example, a diaper fold. Two tension points, has all the same characteristics, it's just that it sits at a diagonal and not a vertical. So this is what I want you to work with for homework this week. Um, and this is exactly how you know I'd like for them to look. What I'll do is on Wednesday, I'll put up another video um, of just another example. That way you don't have to you know, have me doing all the lectures and then integrating them. You can just see me work from start to finish. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, please reach out by email or let me know and we can uh, make an appointment to work together or I can review anything you're having a difficult time with. All right, good luck.